To maintain order, Sergeant Baldwin and the staff keep the prison locked down much of the time. That means prisoners confined to their six by nine cells 24 hours a day for days at a time. Keeping them locked down, they get to calm down. You know, if they be frustrated or filled with rage, they calm down. If you get them time to cool off, you lock them down. Most of them rethink what they're thinking about because they know there's consequences for what they do as well. But even during lockdown, inmates make their anger known. Like you say, it's madness. Yeah. It really is. You see the chaos that's going on right now. <laughs> it's crazy, man. It really is. Terry Dibble is a newcomer to the Roundhouse. He was transferred here a month earlier from a downstate prison for fighting with another inmate. Dibble has served over 10 years for murdering an acquaintance with a shotgun. He has at least 45 years to go. He also killed a second man in a separate incident on the very same day. Dibble's ex-girlfriend lived with one victim. The second had tried to date her. Dibble designed an elaborate tattoo acknowledging the events. The most meaningful piece that I sat down and, and, and designed as far as, you know, thinking ahead was this ribbon. And this ribbon reminds me uh, that I'm responsible for ruining some people's lives. You know what I'm saying? It's what got me in here. And if you take a look at it, it's a ribbon, and it starts in the back. I don't know if you can read that, but it says, three mothers cried. And then when you turn it around, it comes around the front, it says, three sons died. And it goes further down, and it's got the night, the date of my crime. It's got the two men that lost their lives. And it's got myself because my, not, my life basically ended that night as well. Facing decades more in prison, Dibble looks to the outside world to remain sane. If you ain't got somebody on the streets, man, like I said, this, this will consume you. It'll, it's, it, this is like the fire, the all, all consuming fire, man. It'll, it'll, it'll eat you up. About six months ago, 34-year-old Dibble began a romance with a young woman on the outside. His mother arranged it all. I don't know how she met my mom exactly, but she would go to my mom's house and see all my photos and my artwork and, and, and pictures and all that and ask about me, you know, and my mom introduced her to me, so one thing led to another, you know. This is, uh, this is Lydia, and that's Lydia, and that's her friend Sasha. So, yeah, I got, you know, mom hooked me up. Mom hooked me up with a friend, you know, <laughs> but that's cool, you know. When I was at Menard an hour away, they gave me five visits a month. Dibble's got a court hearing coming up, which he hopes will get him transferred back to Menard. It's only an hour away from his new girlfriend. It'll also give him his first chance in many weeks to see both her and his mother. If it doesn't happen, he might not be able to keep the new relationship going. Even murderers need an outlet. If you cut them off totally from the outside society, I think they will feel like they have nothing else to lose because everything they ever wished for and dreamed for is gone. You took it away. So if you take them down to nothing, that's what you're going to get. We miss a lot through the lockdowns. You don't do anything. There's nothing. You don't have any contact really with the other people in this cell house with the different tears, you don't have any contact with anybody. Once a student at the University of Illinois, Simcacha Winfield is a drug dealer serving 63 years. He was convicted of shooting a man to death in a street argument. In his early 30s, Winfield focuses his energy on the world beyond the bars. He's always thinking about his two children. He had his first daughter when he was 17, then a second in a later relationship at 21. He says he tried to be a devoted dad. One of the best parts of being a hustler and, and, and dealing drugs and selling drugs was that I got a chance to actually spend a lot of time, a lot of time with my kids. They're my heart, you know, that's, you know, that, you know, that, that those are my babies. I love them to death. When Stateville is locked down, personal phone calls and visits from the outside are heavily restricted. So it's tough to keep track of what his kids have been doing. I, I, I worry about my kids all day, every day. 
But, you know, I worry, I worry about them just as much as I worry about getting out of prison. Some inmates seem to take Stateville in their stride, um, even if they don't much you know, like the conditions. This is my home. This is considered to be my home, which is my penthouse, if, if you will. You know, over here we have the, you know, the toilet and the water right here. You know, this is whenever, like, for example, when we want to wash up, when we want to wash up, what we do is, is we put this up right here, and then we'll, you know, we'll put this over here like this so we can have a little privacy while we're washing up, you know, get, in, get work while we're in our um, jacuzzi, if you will, over here in the sink, you know. My name is Jericho Jones. I'm from East St. Louis, Illinois, and um, basically I'm locked up for um, aggravated battery, great bodily harm. I received 12 years at 85%. And I've been locked up roughly now, going on eight years. So I'm coming to the end of my rope, and boy, am I grateful for that. Jericho Jones was convicted of aggravated criminal sexual assault of a woman in her 70s, another younger woman, and a 20-year-old man, as well as the attempted rape of a teenage girl. Stateville classifies Jones as a predator, but Jones insists it's because he's been caught having consensual sex in prison, which is against the rules. I specifically got predator because of the fact that I've had several sexual misconducts. Now, who's going to catch sexual misconducts in prison other than the homosexuals? So that put all of us in this situation, so now I've had three or four sexual misconducts. Corrections officers aren't his only worry. He always has to keep a careful lookout for hostile inmates. Heck yeah, I get nervous because of the simple fact that it's some guys that just don't like homosexuals, and they don't give a damn about going to sex, and they will beat the out of you. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna be honest about that. Don't th don't take it wrong when I say it's shut down and there's no problems, because you still get people that will at least fight. You know what I'm saying? They ain't got a problem with whooping your ass. A key spot for violence is the Roundhouse Exercise Yard, an acre of land where inmates can grab a couple of hours of fresh air. It's also where they can get into some nasty fights. To control the potential for violence, officers on the ground restrict the movement and the number of inmates to usually around 20 at a time. While high above, on the towers, men wait with weapons for the first sign of trouble. Officer Halliday is one of them. Halliday knows lockdown often makes inmates edgy, and once out of their cells, they can go off at any time. When you're in a tower and you're assigned to weapons or on the catwalks, you have a direct responsibility and, and you're, you're looked to to use deadly force if it's necessary. But you always have to remember it's the last resort. For armed officers like Halliday, the big question is when to use their weapons. There are usually a couple of shooting incidents every year. When you see four or five men fighting on the yard, you get an idea of how violent the conflict is at that exact moment. And you have to make a pretty quick judgment about whether or not you're going to use the weapon as a warning shot or you're going to have to fire in the proximity of those people in order to try to break that fight up. The goal is to try to make sure that they don't hurt each other and they don't hurt the staff when they come to try to break up the fight. You don't want anyone to get hurt in a prison, but again, you have to remember where you're working. You're working in a prison with some of the most violent people um, in, in the state of Illinois. But when violence comes, it doesn't come in the yard. It comes inside the roundhouse. Morning in the Stateville roundhouse. A prisoner being escorted back to his cell has flipped out and attacked an officer. Sergeant Baldwin needs to get the situation under control fast. Inmate just attacked some officers just for a second. I got all the inmates locked up. Once the uh, situation happened, we wanted to secure the house. Because I just, when I just looked up there, the tower officer told me, look out there, and next thing you know, they was attacking my officers. I don't know yet what their injuries extend is. Right now, all I know is they just got attacked. I just, when I looked out there, I saw the inmates swinging on the officers. The officer in the tower fired a warning shot to stop it. Subdued with pepper spray, the inmate is thrown into a holding cell. Yeah. Man, I ain't do man. 
Yeah, I thought you swing on it. Boom, and man, he stood it on me, man. Yeah, I'm gonna swing back. When I looked around, I saw you swinging on him. Man, when I came through the door, man, he took the cuffs off me, said, no, I got anything to say, man. He pushed me and swung on me, man. Hey, all I, I looked around and saw you swinging on my police. Man, you didn't see that, boy. That's all I saw. The inmate will likely be moved to a different prison. The use of overwhelming force sends a message to other prisoners who might want to start trouble. Baldwin is glad to have a man with a shotgun at his back at all times. The tower helps because it's only natural for every human, most humans, to respond when a gun goes off. They know we are aware of what's going on. They know we, everybody's alert. So they kind of like tend to slow down. So the gun helps a lot. You know, it's job security as I see it. Because that tower is the guy that's gonna get me home. But not only officers worry about staying alive. Gotcha, Bob. Some gotcha, inmates Bob. live in fear of Stateville. Across from the roundhouse is the longhouse once the world's longest continuous cell block until it was chopped into four smaller, safer units. One longhouse inmate refuses to go out of his cell most of the time. You going to chow? No, sir. It's the only place he feels safe. I feel that Stayfield can be very dangerous or any prison can can be dangerous. I feel that it all depends on who you are with or your surroundings. Gregory Crowder is serving 60 years for luring a man into a trap and beating him to death. Crowder and two other men wanted to steal his savings to buy AIDS drugs. Crowder prefers to keep to himself. On the outside, he was a predator. In here, he's a potential victim. People have a stereotype as because you are gay, that you will sleep with them. That's just how they feel, period. In my case, that's not how I feel. Crowder says he has already suffered serious abuse at the hands of officers while awaiting trial at Cook County Jail. I have a high profile criminal case. So my criminal case was on the news and it reported that there was lots of money missing from my criminal case. So there was officers that knew or thought that I had lots of money and that they were threatening me and they beat me and raped me in the Cook County Jail several times. They said that if I ever told anybody that they were going to kill me, but I had to tell somebody because I was afraid for my family. And at that time, I wasn't worried about my life. I was more worried about my mom and my dad. Not only did Gregory Crowder inform the authorities, he sued Cook County Jail in U.S. District Court. His case was settled out of court. Crowder is always fearful of being targeted again, this time by a new cellmate. It's always very intimidating when you don't know who your cellmate is actually going to be because you started to think, is this person going to try to do anything to me physically? Is this person going to try to take advantage of me? Any day now, Crowder is going to see a new unknown face, and he has reason to be afraid. Sergeant Palmer, in charge of Crowder's unit, is responsible for protecting the inmates against attack. In this situation, you have to be a little bit more delicate. You have to make sure that uh, he's not having a, a problem or a situation that doesn't get raped up there, you know, because these guys have been, some of them got a lot of time, man. You know, weird things happen. Weird things happen. At Stateville, even the most ordinary things can be a little weird, including lunch. During lockdown, lunch arrives in styrofoam trays, hundreds at a time. This is actually our lunch. And look at the color of this meat. It's supposed to be bologna, but 
Look, look at the look at the color of it. It's this is disgusting. This is you know, but this is what they give us, and they give us this food on a regular basis. We're definitely not living good in here. That's for sure. You know, despite what the rumors may be, we're definitely not living good in here. This is hell, man. Not, just being away from your family and not being able to do anything. For some Kachu Winfield, it's been far too long between family visits. It's very emotional. Uh, I'm happy. Uh, I'm, I'm ecstatic to see my family all the time. I'm very happy to see them. I hate to see them leave. You know, uh, when I see them, I try to use my visits like with my kids to talk about, you know, any issues that we might have, uh, anything that they've, they, they've done. Uh, uh, their, their mothers have told me I need to address these issues, you know. He just recently received some upsetting news. His older daughter, who's 17, is pregnant. I guess I was, you know, upset when I found out, you know, and who wouldn't, you know, what, what parent wouldn't be because no one, I, I don't think no parent wishes that child to, to be pregnant at 17 years old. You know, you want them to go to school and go to college and, you know, experience life, you know, so I'm, uh... I, I was upset and I'm still, you know, taking the whole thing in, but I know that she can make it and I have to believe and know that she will make it. In a few hours, Winfield's family will arrive for a visit. He'll have a chance to really see if his pregnant daughter is going to make it. It's visiting day at Stateville Correctional in Illinois and cars pull into the prison lot. Among them are Simcacha Winfield's parents and his daughter. They go through an all too familiar drill. Car searches and security checks conducted by officers prevent dangerous contraband like drugs from getting in. Once they clear security, the family sits and waits. We get to visit um, Simcacha about Maybe about three times a month. We visit for an hour, and that's on weekends and holidays. It's one hour visit, and during the week, it's um, two hours. Winfield's daughter knows that her father has mixed feelings about her pregnancy. He knows that I'm pregnant, but he hasn't saw me since I got bigger. When I talked to him, he was mad. He was very angry, and we got into a big argument but she still misses him. It'd be better if he was at home, so. Winfield's father spent a lot of time away for drug-related crimes. I've been incarcerated several times throughout their lives. I know that it influenced him, you know. I'm, I'm sure that it did, and, and we've talked, and he told me that it did. It was two paths that I could have took, and I took path that left, that led to prison. He was faced with the same dilemma. He chose to take the path that I took, you know. Had I not set the pattern in the family, because as far as I know, I'm the first person in our family to ever be incarcerated. Everybody, my father was never incarcerated. His father was never incarcerated. Winfield has just an hour to make sure that his teenage daughter is taking care of herself, especially as she gets closer to giving birth. Surprise. 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 May 29th. May 29th? Yep. Mm -hmm. And the May. What about a parenting class? Mm -hmm. I was going to tell you to get in a parenting class. I already started up. Well, that prenatal stuff? Mm hmm. You learned a lot of stuff now. Oh, this is going well. 
Always. It's always a blessing to see my back. Yeah. <clears throat> always. So, there's so many people that don't get visits, you know, so I, I, I cherish the fact to be able to see, you know, see my family. When people don't have support, they get, they just, you know, man, they, they, they just be down, you know? You know, and they say, well, I don't care, but they, they care. They, they do care. Uh, Is it on? Okay. Boom. All right, well, guess it's time for us to go, y'all. Sergeant McCallum, who was one of the officers in charge of the visiting room, sees Sim Winfield's family often. She knows how much these visits mean to people. It's very emotional. These guys come in and parents are holding on to them when it's time to go. It's sometimes it's, you almost have to put them out because, but you do it as gently as you can, but they be holding on to their son and, and we do, that. we see that a lot. McCallum also sees a lot of girlfriends. And these women come faithfully, not just their family members, girlfriends. And sometimes the guys turn over girlfriends. They might have one to come for the five years. After that five years, she get tired and he pick up on another one, she come for five years. Or they have multiple girlfriends. It's one might come one day, the next one come the next day. But they have a lot of women that come to visit them that really, you know, I guess they love them. Sergeant Baldwin believes that without visitors from the outside, some inmates would be pushed to their breaking point into serious violence. If you took all connections from them from the outside world, it would be very scary in here. Because believe it or not, just that one visit can stop that inmate from going from zero to 10. That can bring him peace. That fact that he can see his little daughter, his son, his mother, I know it's because of them that keeps these guys going because they know there is a light somewhere. There is a reason to live. Like many inmates, Terry Dibble looks desperately to the outside world, to his mother and his new girlfriend, to keep from losing it. But the transfer to Stateville has left Dibble almost totally cut off from them. I worry about her a lot, man, because she's getting up there in age, you know. I'm waiting on her to come up and see me now, but, uh, you know, the medical issues going on with her, she can't travel up here too much, you know. She's seven hours away. Now, he's about to be shipped down to his old prison at Menard in southern Illinois for a court hearing. It may be his only chance to see his mom and his girlfriend, Lydia, for months to come. If, if a girl's going to ride with you 10 years, 15 years, while you're going through this, and she's going to support you fully, emotionally, physically, financially, whatever, she's there for you 100%. Man, you better give her the best you've got. As Dibble readies to leave his cell and visit with his mother and girlfriend at Menard, other inmates are getting sprung too. If only for Chow. It's their first time out since the shooting incident. The officers are on high alert. This is when they are most at risk. The whole point of working in here is security, custody, and control. So as well as watching out for the staff, you're watching out for the inmates' well-being as well. So just make sure there isn't any suspicious behavior, so to speak, you know, things of that nature. Chow may only be a half hour and only 50 inmates at a time, but the officers know a lot can go wrong in a few seconds. There's a lot of pent-up hostility and anger in the air. Cold food, cold showers, playing with our mail, Visit, taking all day with our visit. I've seen things where the dining room is all quiet. The minute we get the running line out, one inmate wants to get at another one, so he runs up and attacks him. It's all about response. Hopefully the tower's watching out and we got a good eye on it. If need be, the tower fire around, either a warning shot and or into the crowd, depending on the type of disturbance that it is. On the walls opposite the inside tower is the evidence of earlier shooting incidents. When they need to take a warning shot, officers try to hit the shot boxes placed nearby. But it isn't always so neat and clean. Most of the time, because it's close range, if you look up there now, you'll see several holes. And that's because you actually don't always have time to put the round into the shotgun box, which requires aim. Sometimes you need to respond quicker than that. So you fire off the round, then you level off the shotgun, you know, to quell the situation. 
Nobody wants to fire their weapon, but sometimes there's no choice. So most of the time around is fired is because an inmate on inmate attack and or inmate is attacking an officer. In Stateville, attacks can come at any place and at any time. So Gregory Crowder chooses to stay alone and safe in his cell. He prepares his own meal with packaged food bought from the prison commissary. After I put the rice, the pepperoni, and the meat inside the meal, I add water for maybe 10 to 15 minutes. I actually call this rice and beans casserole. And now I just let it sit maybe 10 minutes, seven, 10 minutes. But Crowder's cell will soon be the scene of conflict, not home cooking. He won't be alone for much longer. Every day is very, very, very dramatic because you don't know who your cellmate really is. His new cellmate will arrive in just a matter of minutes. When Gregory Crowder's new cellmate arrives, he is not happy. He doesn't want to be put in a cell with a gay man. He's hostile enough that Sergeant Palmer, the head of the unit, steps in and removes him. It's just, we don't want a situation to arise where he has to yeah. fight or, or another inmate has to fight. We're not trying to take people to say, we're not trying to have fights. We're just trying to make sure everybody gets along and works through it, which we have been doing very well. All Crowder wants is a cellmate he feels safe with. He was aggressive and that behavior I wasn't used to, I think that he was a little insane. So I just felt that he had some type of mental illness or some type of health issue. It didn't work out this time, but Stateville is so jammed with men that Crowder is going to face yet another new celly very soon. Stateville tries hard to keep sexually vulnerable inmates and predators apart. With his predator status, Jericho Jones is currently in a cell all by himself. But despite his reputation, Jones has managed to find something rare behind bars. Love. He had a serious relationship with another inmate who is now in the free world. He's the best person that I have ever met. He was so good to me. He, he was not only good to me, he was good for me because when I first met him, I had a low self image about myself. He said, I accept you for you. And he said, that's what make you different from everybody else. You know what I'm saying? He just really picked me up and just made me just, I was with him for 22 months and he just made me a better person on the inside. And so it's like, when I get out of prison, I'm gonna write him, I'm gonna stay in touch with him. And I want to, I really want to spend the rest of my life with him. Jones insists that there is a lot of gay activity behind bars, but it's mostly hidden on what he calls the down low. You just have a whole bunch of insecure guys that are really on the down low. They're really on the down low, and they will go there as long as it's behind closed doors and nobody can see it, and you know what I'm saying? But they put up this front like, yeah, I'm macho. I don't get down like that, please. Jones knows that gay relationships behind bars can be dangerous if only because of unprotected sex. About 1% of the inmates in Illinois prisons are HIV positive, nearly four times greater than the public at large. Condoms are not available since sex is against the rules here, but Jones still tries to be safe. One of the things that I do, for example, is, is if, I, if I engage in homosexual activity, you know, anal sex or whatever, what I do is, is we use plastic. We'll Jones improvises plastic. condoms using plastic bags and latex surgical gloves. He says that the architecture of the roundhouse makes it much easier to have consensual sex without getting caught. And then this building is very unique. This is the last building like this in America. 
This is a historical landmark. There are no buildings in America that's made in a circle like this. So I could, I could just cover up the window and make the cell dark and get on the bed and put a little tent up and get on the bed and I could be having sex with my Sally and looking straight down there at the police and they got to come up the stairs and they got to come across that floor to get up these back stairs and I could stop before it get here. Gay or straight, inmates break the rules all the time, often flagrantly. On the roundhouse floor, Sergeant Baldwin suddenly spots prisoners sending contraband between cells right in front of him. As you see right now, they're passing a line to this inmate right now. They may be passing notes, kites or whatever. Let's hope that it's not something more dangerous like a shank. Using line made from bedding, inmates pass notes, books, drugs, and even shanks or homemade knives from cell to cell. I'm going to pass that right in front of me. They are called kites, and they could be highly dangerous to officers. Baldwin has no patience for this kind of behavior. Tower, open up cell one, four, especially two, after the attack a few days earlier. See what um, what they generally do? They usually have objects in here or alongside the wall. Sometimes they chop a piece out of the wall and they put a shank. So when they're in this cell 24 hours, they come up with creative ways of what they got things and where they have them at. I'm going to have my staff come in and put those inmates in the bullpen, and we will be in here and we will shake this cell down thoroughly. Baldwin's men will search every inch of the cell and confiscate any contraband. It's critical to find anything that can be used against him and his staff. Inmate assaults on staff happen usually several times a year. For officers and inmates, the pressure never lets up. But one inmate is happy, Terry Dibble. He's six hours away from Stateville at Menard Correctional, waiting for his court date. He's out of the Stateville madness for at least a few days, closer to home and much closer to a visit from his mother and girlfriend. I'm definitely glad to be out of Stateville. I'm an hour away from my family here. Uh, I believe I'm going to get a visit later on today. Mom and, and Lydia is going to come up to see us. So that would be great. Yeah, I've been waiting on that for a while because, you know, I haven't seen him in, in probably months. But after Dibble waits for hours, his mother never arrives. He's worried that something's happened to her. That's highly unusual. I'm wondering if she's okay, if maybe she got into an accident. But that's just the beginning. Not only doesn't his mother come, his girlfriend Lydia doesn't show up either. I'm disappointed they didn't show up, and I'm, and I'm definitely concerned because nobody's called, you know? Well, what's going on? That's the, the main thing in my mind. You always ask yourself, what's going on? You know? So if, if she's not here, something happened. Man, I'm pretty sure of it. You know? The question is what, and how am I going to find out? You know? I don't know. All I can do is sit here and, and hope that uh, she pulls up, you know, and hope that the powers that be will still let her in. In fact, Terry Dibble is going to have a longer wait than he expects to see his mother and his girlfriend. Between her two jobs at a daycare and as a waitress and car trouble, 25-year-old college student Lydia Fisher couldn't get to her visit with inmate boyfriend Terry Dibble. It's been nearly two months since she's seen Dibble. From his mother's house, Lydia writes to explain what happened. He's already in a bad position, you know, that is not easy to deal with. And I don't want to make his mind go in other places and make him worry about other things that he doesn't need to be worrying about. And so that is probably the hardest thing. Lydia knew Dibble's mother, who first encouraged her to visit him in prison. I went and talked to him and didn't really expect what happened to happen, but he was just really, really awesome. Like, I'm usually a really shy person. And the first day I went in there, I expected to just be sitting there and not really talking, kind of awkward. but. 
the the visit ended up being like four hours for some reason that day, and there was like not even five seconds of silence. So it was really cool. He's just an awesome person. Six months later, Lydia says she is completely committed to Terry. I love him because he is amazing. He is encouraging. He is, I don't know, he's everything. He is everything that I could have ever wanted or pictured myself with. And um, I know people might think that that's strange because of our age difference, because he's where he is, I'm where I'm at. But I don't care about those people. Despite trying, Lydia couldn't manage to see Dibble yesterday. When he's back at Stateville, it may be nearly impossible for her. But a hearing about his post-conviction case may make all the difference. Dibble will now have the chance to make a motion to be transferred from Stateville back to Menard. Dibble's court-appointed attorney, Jim Steele, wants his client close by to assure a proper appeal. From my perspective, uh, you know, I'm an hour away from Menard. Uh, I'm about five or six hours away from Joliet. Uh, it's a lot easier for me to communicate with him and get together with the things we need to do. Uh, no question, he, uh, you know, he's very concerned about his family. Uh, they've, uh, they've lost a lot of the visitation that they would ordinarily have had if he'd stayed down in Menard, and, and certainly that's a consideration too. Uh, Dibble's mom and other family come to support him. Uh, Illinois law does not allow cameras in the courtroom, but when Dibble comes out of his hearing, he's guardedly optimistic about getting relocated to Menard. And got, a, got another court date for April, so it'll end up back down Menard. I'm hoping so. There, I'm, we think so. We, we think we'll, we'll be back in Menard. We hope. Dibble is unsure of exactly what will happen to him next. If he ever makes it back to Menard, he hopes he'll be able to reconnect with Lydia. At Stateville, Gregory Crowder faces yet another new celly. Unlike the last time, there's no immediate outburst. It's all calm and peaceful. It's going to take a few days to tell, but Crowder thinks it's going to be okay. I think we're very compatible. He's very clean, very nice. I think we're very compatible. Every good day helps when you have more than 50 years to go. Sergeant Baldwin has made it through another shift, keeping the officers, the prison, and the inmates safe. You know, like I said, I deal with what's in front of me. I don't make it personal. So that's how I'm able to deal with it probably more, much better than most people. I very seldom get personal. Today, Baldwin gets to leave Stateville in one piece. But then, there's always tomorrow. And because I can laugh and smile, that makes my day go better. And when anybody laughs, they're not angry. Kind of hard to kill somebody or hit somebody when you laugh. So if I'm making them laugh or they're making me laugh, it's kind of hard to get angry at me. <laughs> I hope. But, but, you know, like I said, they're humans as well. <laughs>